I have a little seed. I put it in the ground. I covered it with earth and I watered it around. Up comes the stem and out come the leaves and up pops the flower that comes from the seed. Flowers come in many colors from all around the world. Flowers give good feelings to all the boys and girls. Now that's something you probably never expected at Liberty on the Rock's Flatirons. Somebody's singing. And many of you are probably thinking, has Beck flipped his lid? Or we are in Colorado. Did I inhale? Let me assure you, I did not inhale. I did not go off the deep end. But that little song I wrote almost 25 years ago for a program called Growing Up with Flowers, teaching children about my industry, the flower business. And it was really cool because a group of us got together. We were known as the Young Executives of WUFSA, the Wholesale Florist and Floral Suppliers Association of America. And if you say that fast three times, it comes out as WUFSA. I love it. <laughs> Nothing to do with animals. But we were given a budget of zero to come up with a program to help influence young people and teach them about the beauty of our industry. And what's really cool about it is we would go in and do presentations to all grades. I like the little kids from preschool, elementary, uh, first grade, and teach them about the beauty of our industry. And I would sing that little song, and then we'd give them some bud bases and pass around some flowers, and then make an arrangement. And the idea was if we could get a positive first impression of flowers to children, little boys who went to their first, I say little, young men who went to their first dance would not be afraid to buy a corsage or boutonniere for their date that day. Or perhaps, as most of us as kids, when dad bought mom flowers, what would happen? Don't touch those flowers. Or grandma or grandpa passed away. And we all know the beauty of flowers, they soften the hardness of a funeral. But it kind of sends a, a wrong message to a little kid associating death and flowers. So we wanted to do something positive and talk about a way to get people involved in our industry. So we got wholesalers and retailers and educators together and started to do this program. And we've influenced a generation of young people. And every year when I go back to Erie Elementary, I do this program, it's amazing. These little kids come by and they say, oh, you're the flower man. Folks, I can tell you, I rose from a carnation. I'm in hard goods. I'm on the other side of the business. But my passion is for the industry and the beauty of our flowers. And so I bring that story up because if we're going to change the culture, if we're going to do anything, we've got to start with the youth. And so one of my passions is working with young people. And so the Growing Up with Flowers program is, to me, something that is important. So tonight, I want to talk about influence. What is influence? What do we mean by influence? Of course, up here it says the capacity to have an effect on character, development, or behavior of something or someone have an effect. So how many of you have ever had any influence on anybody? Kids? Okay. Have you ever been on a sports team or, or coached with kids? Had influence, right? So tonight I want to give you a little roadmap of where I'm going to take you. I'm not anything special. All of us have had experiences, and I want to talk about some of my experiences with people and with uh, personalities with political and public policy. It's kind of the roadmap that I set out. And you'll have a couple of key takeaways. One is going to be a structure that you can implement right when you leave here. And it's a very simple structure. I've taught many Toastmasters over the year. But then we're also going to give you a public policy advocacy structure as well. Because one of the biggest bugaboos I have every time I come to one of these wonderful events and listen to people talk is that we don't take action. We are some great speakers, but what do we do about it? And so one of the things I'm going to challenge you tonight with is taking what I'm going to present and do something with it. One thing. So let's start off with the mind. To me, you got to start off with your head. And one of my gurus, Jeffrey Gidmer, who wrote the little red book of sales and the sales Bible and the little yellow book of Yes Attitude talks about you control the most important thing, your mind in selling. We talk about the source of all wealth is the mind, right? So what does he mean by that? Well, one of the things I like about Gittimer is he talks about how do you attract people to your message? How do you connect people to your message? How do you engage people to your message? And he always talks about giving value first. Now, what is value? 
Could be a paper, it could be your time, could be money. It's whatever somebody else you're dealing with thinks is of value. I'm in the flower business, and it always takes 11 impressions, maybe 12, to get people to remember them. Gentlemen, that's why roses come in dozens. Buy your lady some roses. It always makes an impression on a lady. So that's a cheap trick that I like to sell promote the industry. We always hear a lot of different cliches. Think outside the box. I hate that. I like to think outside the bubble. And every time I see this picture, it cracks me up because we live our lives in a bubble. We chase our tail 24-7. We're always busy. and We never get the things we want done, never noticing that we've got a different way to access and do something different. Now, does anybody know what the average attention span is of a goldfish? There's actually studies on this in England. Any idea? Throw out. Close. Six. A little longer. It's about eight seconds. The average attention span of an audience probably is a lot less. So how do you grab somebody's attention in the beginning? If you've ever made a presentation to a city council or to the state of Colorado or even in Washington, D.C., you've got to have your stuff down. I'll give you 10 seconds. You're done. <laughs> I buy. But you've got to get your message across quickly. So how do you do that? We'll talk about it. So let me talk about some people stuff. As Mike mentioned, I am a card-carrying member of the Optimus Club of Erie, Colorado. And every morning when I wake up and every night, I recite this creed. Now, some people meditate, some people pray. Everybody does something different. I do the creed. And the reason I do, it gets my mind focused for success for that day. And I know the creed works. My friend Laura Carno, when I gave her the copy of this creed, went out and bought, you know, a hundred of these things and passed them out to a lot of people. But the reason I bring this up is because we are known as the friend of youth organization in our community. We influence young people in my town of Erie. There's an optimist like a Kiwanis or Rotary all over. So one of the things I do every year is I do Liberty Day. Jimmy Sandberger started this thing with Andy Bean, going into the schools, teaching kids about the Constitution. And what we do uniquely in Erie, Colorado, is we go into local elementary school and bus 100 kids down to the Capitol every year. And I have to tell you, we've been doing it for the last five years, and these kids remember it as the highlight of their year, going through the historical tour, the legislative tour, going up to the rotunda. It has impact. So the challenge is, how do you have impact with youth? We even have the day before, or a couple days before, we'll have an elected official come in and present to the kids. Oh, you know that guy? He's in the back. He and his cohort both have done it a couple times. But what's amazing here is the kids get to hear about local government, state government, and federal government. What's the difference? How the government impacts their lives. We hand them a constitution, and inside this constitution, are 24 questions. So they go up to their legislatures and legislators and say, you know, how old do you have to be to be a president of the United States? And it's funny that some of the folks in the State House have no clue on a lot of these questions. So it's amazing for these kids to go in and see where government starts and how it affects their lives. Then they get to go in and here's a, a picture of, a, of the State House. So the Optimist Club, for me, is a way to influence young people, to get young people to see the fabric of the community, just like Kiwanis or Rotary or any of those organizations that used to be prevalent throughout America. And now with the government stepping in with so many programs, you don't have as many people in these service clubs. So that's one opportunity to have influence. The next one is personal. So a couple years ago, I got tired of fighting on Facebook. How many of you have ever won a battle on Facebook by show of hands? One, Tim, I know. Russ, okay, maybe three or four. Most of us look at it and go, really? Delete, right? Or we unfriend. So a couple of years ago, I just decided to do something more visual. I'll have some written things, but to me, what people are attracted to are what I put on my Facebook post, usually on Sunday, when all the honeydews are done and my beautiful bride lets me sit there with a bourbon and a cigar and a great book, and I'll sit, there you go, and Dave, Dave comes over every once in a while for one of those. And what's really cool about it is it's attracted friends from all over. I grew up in Southern California, very liberal household. Uh, you know, we voted Democrat for years, just the way it was. I mean, I grew up in a Jewish household, and that's what you did. You went with the herd. Well, my friends who are still in Southern California, when I went back to my 43 union, 
they kept mentioning to me, I love your post. Because they're not argumentative. Oh, by the way, how was that cigar? Or how was that bourbon? Or how was that book? And I've sent books to folks. And so I've got the visual, or the written there, but the written word doesn't have as much impact as the visual, especially in social media. So how are you impacting your sphere of influence, your family, your friends, your coworkers, with imagery? And there's just a series of ones, the Constitution and Declaration I put out there every year. Uh, this one on uh, Guy Benson and Mary Catherine Ham. I know it works because I've had people replicate it. Uh, this is Amber Clay, and she started doing it with her friends. Ooh, that looks good. Can I have some? Yeah. yeah awesome. <laughs> so political. Now, I'm very active in the Boulder County Republicans. I have for, for several years. I was a former vice chair. I do their breakfast meeting once a month. And in Erie, Colorado, we have what's called uh, fracking problems, supposedly. DeAndrea knows. And uh, we always are ha getting hammered by the noisy few. And I got tired of it, so I went down to the town meeting that they were going to put a moratorium on fracking in Erie. Well, as I walked up, I happened to be the earliest one there. They said, from Vital from Colorado, had 300 signatures from citizens of Erie. Would you present these as evidence to the town council? I said, sure, because the opposition had about 600 names, of which 300 were not even Erie residents. So we kind of balanced it out. Well, I gave that little bit of testimony, which was online. And the next morning, I'm driving into work. Can you imagine? seeing your face above the fold in your newspaper, about crap. But then I pulled over and then I bought every one of them so everybody at work could not see <laughs> could not see that. And then as I got to my desk, my boss had that sitting on my desk. And he said, what's that all about? I said, well, you know, I like hot water and refrigeration and indoor plumbing and all the good things of modernity. So I had to get up there and do something about it. And we actually stopped them from putting a moratorium on oil and gas in Erie. Folks, you can do the same thing. I'm nothing special. All I did was show up and hand these to the town council. Uh, one a funny little note there, I walked up and on the, the lectern up there, it says no food or drink at the podium. Of course, being a Toastmaster, that is not a podium, that is a lectern. So I had to tell them that and they all rolled their eyes and said, you're an idiot, no way. Which my fellow Toastmasters tell me all the time. The really cool thing is, Jared Polis is really small there, and the Dalai Lama was on page three, so I felt pretty good about it. <laughs> from this experience, though, I got called from Sean Boyd from CBS, and they were doing more fracking in our community. So she calls me up and says, hey, can you come in there and make a comment about what's going on with fracking in the center of town? I said, no, ma'am, I don't live in the center of town. I live up in Erie Village. Would you please come up and see what we've done, our experience, with Encana Oil and Gas? So she was good enough to do it. She came up, did about an hour interview, and then I took her to our park. And in our park, it was a small pocket park that was surrounded by open space. So I was on the HOA board, got tired of looking at the, the well. So I'm in an appointment with Encana and said, hey, we'd like to come up there, make a presentation, berm up, put trees, bushes around the oil well, you just not see it anymore. And what was really interesting was, well, if you guys just hang out for about a year, we think we may pull that well out. I said, take two years. I don't care. So they did. Within about nine months, they took out the well. And by law, all they have to do is replace it with what was there originally, the buffalo grass. Well, they tied into our sprinklers, put about 12 inches of amendments in, put in sod, and then gave me a check for $140,000 to make a park instead of an open space. The people in the town were amazed. All the, around, the surrounding communities were blown away, and they kept coming and calling me and said, how did you do that? And it was pretty simple. I was nice. I didn't accuse them. I didn't call them names. And it was amazing how many people started to come to me and say, how can we do that? And so it's a, it's a, it's a conversation rather than an argument. How do you influence oil and gas? you got to talk to them. You can't make them the enemy. and Too many people have made them the enemy. So in the Boulder County Republicans, a couple of uh, our leaders in the marketing and messaging, uh, Scott Schaefer and uh, Bill Zimmer, or Bob Zimmer, came up with uh, some bus ads. And we put these all over Boulder. Now, can you imagine size matters? Big government, eat your freedom, bocogop.org. 
The left was tearing out their hair. They didn't know what to do because here are all these Republican billboards moving along in Boulder. And we had a blast with them. Big government debt is stealing her, her future. That number is probably about three times now. But the idea was we were trying to have fun with the message of saying, hey, there's something different with the Boulder County Republicans. And one of the things we started doing was showing up to events. I mean, this Monday is Martin Luther King holiday, right? How many of you are planning to go into the MLK march? See? Nobody. We need to show up if we're going to change hearts and minds. So we started showing up about four or five years ago. We went to the Cinco de Mayo event in Longmont. It was hysterical. We sent our tent up right across from the Democrats, and we had four Hispanic activists come up and say, it's about time you showed up. And then they said, we hate you guys, but we're glad you're here. And it was cool. We had a great dialogue. Well, one day I'm sitting up there with uh, George Lang, who's a gentleman there who ran for CD2 against Jared Polis. And we just got finished putting up this tent. And we were going to go have a, a, a beverage. And this guy comes up to us and said, oh, you Republicans are racist. I said, really? And he went on and let him rant. And then he left, and then he came back, and I found out he was the head of the opposition. And I said, uh, excuse me, sir, do you realize that that gentleman's Chinese and I'm Jewish? So I don't know how we can be racist. You tell me. And it was pretty funny. We had a good dialogue, actually. But he was trying to goad us. We have shown up at more events in the last four or five years, the, the Pride Festival, the Creek Festival. And it's amazing because that sign and what we do to engage people, we play the world's smallest political quiz from the Students for Liberty, has five personal, five economic questions. And as people are walking up and down uh, a fairway, we'll say, hey, are you politically homeless? And I go, homeless? I don't, I'm not homeless. I go, no, no, do you have a political philosophy? And we'll say, hey, answer these five questions, personal, economics. They put a, a little dot on the board, whether they're conservative or they're big government, if they're libertarian or centrist. And if they're more to our liking, then we'll say, hey, you know, we've got all kinds of events you might want to engage us on. If they're more big statist or if they're, you know, liberal, we'll say bless their heart and we move them along. But, you know, we try to engage people. And we think about half a million people are impacted by the very fact that we show up at these different events based on what the people who are running those events say come to those particular uh, activities. So I'm going to give you a structure now. One of the things we do, I've done in Toastmasters, but I've done it speaking at town councils, I've done it at uh, when I'm selling, is the first thing i got to know is my audience. You've got to know what your audience is. What is the audience thinking? Well, you're thinking of that radio station in your head, WIIFM, what's in it for me? You really don't care about me. You care about yourself, and you should. Be self-interested. So one of the things I always teach is the hook, the hammer, and the hinge. And this idea comes from a world champion of public speaking named Dana Lamont. Dana was four years old. He fell down, went blind. Oh, by the way, he was black. So black in Southern California in the 70s, he didn't have a lot of options. He became a lawyer. First black blind lawyer in L.A. County. He wanted to become a judge. They said, we've never had a black blind judge in Southern California. He became the first. He wanted to be the first blind world champion of public speaking, and he became it. And I had the good fortune of learning this technique from him, and it worked every time. So the first thing is the hook. How do you grab somebody's attention? I did it by singing. Hopefully I grabbed your attention. You said, what the heck is going on with this guy? But you do it with a question or a statement or a quote to grab somebody's attention. So for instance, if I'm talking to some people that are let's say liberal or middle of the road, I might say something like this. The 22nd and 24th president, Grover Cleveland, was a great American president. He was a bourbon Democrat. He was the last conservative Democrat to serve in office. Believed in free silver. Today, we would say he was probably a Republican, dare I say. This is Grover Cleveland. Now, do you want to hear more? Is there an opportunity to go, that's interesting, I've never heard that before. I'm trying to engage people with an idea that they've not heard. The next part is the hammer. You want to transition to make a point and tell a story. To make a point, tell a story, make a point, tell a story. Stories 
we're, bless you, we're hardwired for stories. And if you can get people at the heart first, you might get them at the head. But you got to start here. So what I always suggest to people is come a little closer, get a little more involved, and find out how you can get that balance between head and heart. You got to make them think, but you also got to make them feel. How do you do that balance? Stories do it. They've been doing it in every culture, in every group of people for eons. So transition from the hook to the hammer to the hinge. What's the hinge? It's like the hinge of the gate. What's your call to action? What do you want me to do after I spend some time talking with you? You want me to vote? You want me to give you money? You want me to write an op-ed? How many of you have written an op-ed last year at all? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What's that? Facebook. Not Facebook doesn't count. Newspaper, old school. So that's pretty good. Just think if everybody in this room one time a year wrote an op-ed, how powerful that could be. Whether it's for an issue, or in this case, I just wrote, thank you to Erie. When we did the town fair, it was awesome. Because people came by and waved with all five fingers. We didn't get anybody screaming at us, and this was just after our president got elected. People were coming by who were business people, had tents, and were going like this, you know. I mean, it was amazing. So we show up, and then we write about it, and we get a response. And I've got a lot of positive response on this. So now let me switch to public policy. And one of the things I do in my business is I've been active in a variety of industry organizations. One in particular that I've worked with is the Society of American Forests. They're an umbrella group that engages our public, or as I like to say, Congress critters, in Washington, D.C. on public policy. This group is made up of wholesalers, growers, retailers, my friend Sandy from Lafayette Florist, and my business. A lot of people don't know what I do. I enhance people's lives with color. Oh, translation. I sell spray paint in the flower business. And our office is in Boulder, Colorado. And I tend to have longer conversations if I enhance people's lives with color rather than sell aerosols. So that's how I, I preface it. But what we do is we go up on Capitol Hill. And what's amazing to me, with the first year I went up on Capitol Hill, I was trying to talk to the growers about a free market approach to immigration. And one leg of that was a free market idea called the red card solution to get workers to come to America. And None of them had ever heard of this idea. So I tried to get Helen Griebel, the originator of this idea, to come to speak to us. She wasn't available. So I got somebody else, and he spoke. Well, I didn't go with protocol. I just invited him. And then he made a presentation. And then I got my head handed to me because I didn't go through the protocol. But as I told the people who asked me to be on this committee, I'm not going along to get along. So if you don't like what I have to say, say goodbye to me now. And so... I create a little, you know, wake in their, in their way of doing things. But one of the things we do every year when we go to Washington, D.C., is we do advocacy. Now, what is advocacy? Well, here it's defined as the act of pleading or arguing in favor of something. I don't like the term pleading. It's more of a, de a definition from the dictionary. But it's actually an act. I like the idea of an act. You gotta do something. So what we do is we get a briefing by our on-staff lobbyists. And I know lobbyist is a bad word, but with the amount of turn in Washington, D.C. or in Denver, and Mary knows because she's been there and done that, you know, you've got to have people who know about the processes and know about structure. So they really, if you, if you work with them well, they can tell you a lot of things you're not aware of. So Lynn Smalley is an expert in greenhouse and pest management. And so when we go on Capitol Hill and they're trying to ban certain things for no other reasons other than there's a certain group of loud people who don't like certain pesticides. Mary will give us the right terminology to use when we go see our Congress critters. The next bit I'm going to give to you is from Stephanie Vance, and she's brilliant. Stephanie actually was a legislative assistant for uh, a Democrat in Oregon. And she comes to us every year, and she gives us the structure to talk to our elected officials. And it's amazing how much it makes a difference. So the first thing we do is we role play. Stephanie will act like she's one of the legislators, and then we've got to ask her what we want to do, and I'll give you the structure here in a minute. There's four effective principles in legislative advocacy. And this is something, whether it's at, in Denver, at the Capitol, or in Washington, D.C., that we can all do. 
Number one, you've got to know what you want. A lot of people go to D.C., knock on the door. Hi, I'm here. Thanks for what you're doing. Uh, they'll thank you and then kick you out the office. They don't care. So you've got to know what you want and what you want to do. Know how to talk to them. Know what their ears are listening for. You also have to know who you're talking to. And then follow up with a thank you. Very simple four step. And as uh, one of the world champions of public speaking uh, has said, repetition plus restatement gets people to remember. So I'm going to repeat this in a different way. The first thing you got to ask for is your ask. What do you want? So for the last 10 years prior to the tax change, we were going up on the hill and asking them to repeal the death tax. Finally, they've repealed it. But it took a long time. D.C. takes a lot longer. Denver is a little easier. Your local municipality, you go shopping with those people. So your ask is important. How many of you ever taken out your local trustee or town counselor to the coffee? Anybody besides me? I know DeAndrea. Why not? Does Mike count? Mike counts. Okay. <laughs> he's, he's here in Broomfield, right? You can buy him a beer or let him buy his own beer. But, you know, we need to engage these people. We elected them and then we walk away. We don't challenge them and say, why are you doing this? Why do we have a sustainability committee? Why do we have open space and parks that we can't use? It makes no sense. So we've got to challenge them. We've got to have that ask. Next, you want to know something specific that you want them to do. Repeal the death tax. And then you've got to ask them either to introduce legislation or code co-sponsor. And it's important to know what their position is on those different structures. Do you want to vote for or against a bill? Do you want them to work on your behalf or do you want to work with another coalition? So the policy makers and their staff are key. A lot of times we don't even meet with a legislator or senator. We'll meet with their assistant. And I've got to tell you, Washington, D.C. is run by 20-somethings. They're not little kids. They're not uh, unimportant. They've got the ear of the senator or the legislator. So you've got to be respectful of them, even though they may be just right out of college. These kids are sharp. They would not be in those uh, positions if they weren't, and even here down at the state house. So you've got to know who you're going to be speaking to. So there's a questionnaire we usually fill out and do a little homework before we go to D.C. I do it here when, in Denver as well. There's six key questions You've got to ask yourself and ask them about what their business is down at the Capitol. Number one, what issues do the policy maker care about? And you can go online and see what they're all about. What's their record on the issue? How have they voted? What committees or subcommittees are they on? Is there a mismatch? You've got to make sure you're going to the right committee that they're on as opposed to something that they're not on. Where are they on the seniority scale? Are they new? Have they been there a while? What party are they? Um, are they, you know, this dice or are they libertarian? Or are they like me, the cocktail party? That's my favorite party. Do they have a staff in, in Denver? Do they have a staff in D.C.? I'm sure they do. But who on the staff do you need to talk to? If you're going to work locally, you may want to work with a caseworker first. If you have a veterans affair issue. Local is probably better. Doesn't doesn't do much unless it's really a uh, an issue that the uh, DC can do. You have schedulers, field representatives, and then the office director. In DC, it's a little bit different. You've got the legislative assistant, again a scheduler, press secretary, and chief of staff. And we've had the good fortune of meeting with all these folks at different times when we've gone there. But a lot of times, you know, things get backed up. A senator or legislator may be on the floor. And they don't have any room. It's backed up. All their offices are full. Other people, other committees are there. And so a lot of times we've met in the hallway, and you've got five minutes, and you've got to make your ask. And you better do it, because otherwise you'll get another chance. So one of the things we do is we use a spit rule. <sighs> no, not that kind of spit. Like a spit on a lamp. Be specific. I want to repeal the death tax. Then you've got to make sure that they know that it's personal. What's your story? When we were talking about repealing a portion of the Obamacare mandate on the minimum hours, they said 35 hours was the minimum for full time. Okay. In the floral business, 
if you're working a greenhouse, half time is probably 70 hours, especially when you're harvesting. Wendy knows that. She worked hard on the growing before. We, there was a woman who worked at Tagawa Greenhouses who had a great story, 75 years old, wanted to go to halftime, which to her was about 55, 60 hours a week. And we relayed this story to several of our Congress creditors, and they used it on the House floor. So it does have impact on when you tell your story. Be informative. Tell them who you are, what you do, and how your business is impacted by what they say and what they do in their legislation. Be trustworthy. Don't lie. Don't make up stories. Tell them how it is, and then you'll be able to come back to them with this message formula. And this is probably the most important thing that I learned from Stephanie Vance that we've used over and over again, and it works like a charm. It works in Denver. It works in D.C. Hello, my name is Bradley Beck. The most important word, I'm a constituent, and I'm from Erie, Colorado. Constituent will get you an ear. That's huge because you put them into office. Or maybe you didn't put them in office, but you're still a constituent. I'm here to talk about let's say death taxes, or taxes in general. Knowing your interest on the House Ways and Means, I think you'd be interested in this as well. This is important to me, and then you tell them your story. And then you come in. That's why I hope you'll either vote for or against, co-sponsor, and i like to follow up. Who in your office is the person I should be in touch with? That's huge. And then here are some tips. Volume does not equate to getting anything done. I know people that will send something once a week. They're not going to pay any more attention. They're busy. When the time comes for it to come up, if you've been trustworthy, if you've given them good information, they will contact you, and they often do. Always identify yourself as a constituent. Most important words. Be specific. What do you want them to do? Prioritize your request. Now, usually we go in with three different asks, sometimes two. But to get more than two or three, they're not going to listen to you. They don't have the time. And so you've got to know what you want to get done. You've got to be patient. It doesn't happen overnight. It's gridlock for a reason. The founders set it up that way. But there is progress. And so it takes time. You do have to be persistent. Don't make ultimatums. Don't tell them that you're going to come in there and do whatever because they're just going to say thank you very much and bye. They won't let you back in. Always tell the truth. Otherwise, there are consequences because they'll call you to the carpet out of your way. And then don't vilify your opponents, even though you hate Diana to get. Um, did I say that? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but you want to make sure that you know, you're know you above board and you just like to be friendly, be engaging. Don't talk about their campaigns. That's a big no-no. Please do not say, I just contributed $1,000 to your campaign. Now will you do this for me? Uh-uh. Ain't going to fly. And then always thank the staff. Emails work best if you send a letter, it goes through the machine, it turns out yellow, so, you know, don't do that. You can send a letter, but it just takes longer, and it looks crinkly when it's done. You've got to do your messaging in five minutes, folks, because they don't have the time. It's got to be quick. Clarity and conciseness will get them to listen to what your message is. And then, give them a folder of information. I always put buy flowers, because, you know, that's my business. A little information about who you are, the people in your industry, how many people are employed by it, what kind of businesses are in the local areas that they can come and visit, because that's huge for them. They like photo ops. So if you can get them to be engaged on an issue, they can use your place as a backdrop as well. Here's your ask. You want to leave them behind, the two or three things you want from them. One of the things is interesting. This third one here just came up recently. It's the Andean Trade Act that just expired. Flowers from now Ecuador are going to be 30% more that the wholesale distributors now have to pay as a tariff when they come into this country, which directly goes to a retail florist, which means you, when you buy flowers, if they happen to be Ecuadorian, are 30% more. So that's one of the reasons why we go there and say, why are we having this tariff? And then you'll get the local California folks working on some kind of consolidation, and they'll say, they make sense because they could block it. They could go to their legislators and say, we don't want imported product. But the industry has, over the years, worked out a lot of these bugs. Send them a, a, leave them with a company bio sheet, bless you, 
a bio sheet on your background and your company, a little bit about some of your extracurricular activities, and then your business card, your contact information. And again, I can't emphasize it enough to thank you. It's huge. There's too many people make demands, and they just throw that stuff in the trash. Every year we go back, uh, if the chief of staff is there or a legislative assistant, they go, oh, you're the flower people, and they pull up our folder, they hand it to the person we're seeing, so they know us. Used to be able to do a little thing where we gave out flowers, but now with the, uh, the different regulations, you can't even have a, an event there in D.C. anymore and have flowers to give out to people. It just, it's gotten really strict. So the reason I bring all this up is because I don't want us to be like this. Dried up, we listen to stuff here at Liberty on the Rocks or other things. We go to lectures at CU Boulder. We go to different places. We hear great speakers. And then we go, oh, isn't that nice? And what do we do? What do we do? We do nothing. So what I'm going to challenge you with is to bring some innovation, to bring your ideas, to bring your effort and energy to do one thing in the next year. One thing. Write an op-ed. Walk a block as a, as a caucus person. I mean, it's not a lot of time. If everybody does one thing in this room, we can win hearts and minds, especially with you. And I know Dave goes and stands in front of supermarkets, pass out the Constitution. Awesome. One thing. You know, we can all do things. Uh, in the produce section, <laughs> you're filling the fruit. Is that what you're telling me? You know, we all have busy lives, but we've all got to do something. Otherwise, the opposition never rests. They never sleep. And then we sit home and watch the news and we yell and scream and nothing gets done. Well, you know, I try to do something every day. One thing a day. Now, my wife lets me do that, and I know most of you are married or, you know, you got significant others and, you know, you got lives. But I try to do something every day. So here's what I like to do. I love baseball. Great quote by the great Yogi Berra. It says, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. So I'd like you all to indulge me. I'd like you to practice with me. So I'm going to ask you all to stand up. I'll stand up. I know you've been sitting there listening to me kind of stretch. Stand up. I'm going to teach you that little flower song I started with. <laughs> You're all going to try it. You don't even have to sing. You can just say the words. Okay, here we go. I have a little seed. I, little seed. I, put, it in the ground. I put it in the ground. I covered it with earth. I it with earth. And I watered it around. Up comes the stem. Out come the leaves. Up pops the flower. That comes from the seed. I hope I've planted a seed in your mind. But more importantly, you all stood up. Under your seats is something. You've got to reach kind of in the middle. If you reach under your seat, there's something there. What's there, Russ? Fiat currency! Fiat currency. You've been bribed. Now there's a buck. The reason I put a buck there under your seat is every once in a while, you got to get off our ass to make a buck or do something. <laughs> that dollar, thank you, that dollar is for you to either keep and put in your wallet or your purse to remind you to do something, or as I'm going to do, I'm going to give it to Mike, and you know, we'll have 50 bucks for Mike for Liberty on the Rocks. My name's Bradley Beck. Thank you very much. I'll be answering questions. Standing ovation. Questions? David. It's not really a question, Brad. I mean, wonderful speech, very inspiring. And the message to me is. When you go to try and convince someone of something, you're not just selling the idea, you're selling yourself. And if, and if you sell yourself, they're going to listen to the idea even if they don't agree with it. If you don't sell yourself, it doesn't much matter what you sell. Right. And you got to have fun with it, too. I mean, when I was working with Don Beasley for House District 33, 
we had some funny stories. We were walking in one neighborhood one day, and these two women were walking with their babies on their shoulders. And as habit was, I'd always say, hey, this is Don. He's running for House District 33. And the ladies looked at us and said, we thought the election was the other day. We said, no, that was the primary. And one looked at the other and said, you mean there's more? <laughs> you know, I mean, they don't know what goes on in the process. So we have to constantly just be, have fun with it and enjoy it and, and teach it. So thank you, Dave. For so, yeah. I got a question. Why does my dollar have James Madison on it? <laughs> Does it? Do you print these? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> at, at what point in your conversations with uh, political people or, or corporate people do you challenge the idea that have you really thought about what the principle is? I mean, don't you understand the principle of, let's take something, don't you understand the principle of free markets? I mean, is, is that getting in the way of, does someone find that offensive to them, that you would challenge them on that? And, and how do you deal with that? Because I think that's one of the frustrating things when I talk to, uh, that's one of the questions with them that try and pose to Bill Owens when, when, when he's at the Lincoln Club. Sure. Is, Really, what did you do that that when you were in office you really put forward the understanding of what the Constitution is? That's a great question, Tom. And so one of the things, going back to that, that hammer, is I always try to suggest to people is tell your story and tie it to a point. And the point usually for me is a principle. So, for instance, if somebody's talking about doing something in Erie, we've got a business license. For businesses, once a year they've got to pay $25, $35, whatever. And my question is, why? Aren't we supposed to have a limited government? They can move to Broomfield. The well, I'm trying to get them to move to Erie <laughs> to open up more restaurants. So are we business friendly? So what I try to do is I'll take my uh, town trustees to coffee, and I'll challenge them. I'll say, you know, it's interesting. We have that fee. What's the purpose of it? Is it to raise revenue? Thank you. You're being honest. Or is it just to because that's what we've always done. So is the proper role of government to protect our rights at any level, state, local, or federal, or is it to give us stuff? To me, it's to protect our rights. And one of the things that taxation does is it gives us the things that we need that are enumerated by either local, state, or federal, and we need to know that. So if we're going to be active citizens, we've got to know to be self-assertive, to be self-reliant, uh, to be able to know our civics, to where we can challenge our elected officials. And if we don't, they'll just keep doing what they're doing. So to your point, I, I get frustrated too when they say they're an R or an L and they do something else. So we just have to keep reminding them that, hey, we're here, we're not going anywhere. Principles of Liberty does that all the time. They rate their, their the legislators. If you present that to them, they say, oh, that you that they will listen or that they'll understand or, or does that kind of, do they kind of pull back and say I'm not listening to you anymore? So I try to make them laugh. Okay. I try to do some humor. And the reason I do it, I'll, many of my Toastmaster friends know, I'll talk about my granddaughter Libby was standing in front of a, a plaque with the Apollo astronauts and I said, Libby, who was the first man on the moon? And without missing a beat, she said, Louis Armstrong. <laughs> well, she got half of it right. Government sometimes gets it half right. A lot of times they get it half wrong. And they think what you're doing is wrong. I get them laughing. They'll say, yeah, it's kind of absurd, isn't it? So think of those little stories or those personal experiences. Experience is a huge word. I've experienced this. Can you do something that we can do together to make a difference or to change that law? But if you just go there and accuse them, like in my oil and gas story, they're going to tell you to pound dirt. So it's a process. Thanks for the question. Other questions? So you're all going to go out tomorrow, write an op-ed, walk a precinct, right? Do something with that dollar. Give it to Mike. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.